Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Uli Salazar from Ludwig. Uli, how are you, man? I'm doing well, Bart. Uh, very excited to be a guest here on your podcast. I've been listening for uh, uh, quite some time now and definitely love a lot of the features that you do. So I'm pretty stoked to be here. Awesome. Thank you. Well, you come highly recommended um, from our mutual friend and, and Ludwig artist, Stephen Wolf. Um, I was telling you before, he has like since day one recommended you. So this has been a um, it's been been in the works for a while in my mind. And we met at uh, PASIC. I was checking out the Ludwig booth um, last year, which was awesome. Very cool to see uh, everything you guys have going on there. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was really awesome to connect. Steven is awesome. He's just been a uh, a really good, uh, great ambassador for Ludwig uh, over the years that he's been on the team. Obviously, he's been a massive fan of the brand and the product for years, um, and has used it in a lot of his projects. But uh, yeah, we've definitely spent some time going down the gear rabbit hole and just just talking about gear at nauseum sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Which which that's what this is all about right now. Totally. So um, so yeah, today we're talking about the Black Beauty. Um, which is one of the most famous and kind of sought after snares in the world. Um, growing up, it just seemed like to me, it was this like, like mythical snare drum, like almost like, um, like I li- I remember being like a kid and like, you know, I was in that age of like, I was born in 90. So being into like Pokemon cards or something <laughs> and, and equating it to like finding a black beauty. It's this rare, rare, super rare thing, which it is. So, um, why don't you just kind of tell us all about it? And because uh, it didn't start out named as a Black Beauty, obviously. So take it away, my friend. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the what's now known as the Black Beauty actually came out uh, in nineteen nineteen as the inspiration model. Um, it was available in a, a few different size, uh, uh, in a few different sizes, um, de- mostly different depths. They did do fifteen inches. Uh, it was a six slug drum originally, uh, but evolved over time to uh, be available as an eight lug and as a 10 lug. Um, there's a lot of things about the build of that shell that has changed over time. Uh, but overall, the thing that really makes it unique is the, the brass alloy. Obviously, the black nickel plating aesthetically is just jaw dropping. And so that's where yeah. it, it got its nickname from. Uh, and obviously the, the center beat, there's just, you know, something sort of timeless about that complete package of that drum um, that as it's existed in our catalog over the last uh, 100 plus years, um, it's definitely taken a, it's definitely built quite a, quite a big fan base. One of the things too to note about the center beat, that was actually um, uh, an industry first by Ludwig, uh, as well as the side lever throw off. Uh, really? Amongst many things, but yeah, the, the center bead um, uh, uh, spec on a, on a metal metal shell was uh, Ludwig was first to do that. Um, now, what is that? What is the purpose of the center bead? What does that do? Uh, uh, the center bead has um, a few purposes, but its primary purpose was for support. Um, okay. The shells back then were tack welded at the center. Uh, I think maybe maybe John Aldridge talked about this uh, on your podcast sure. as well. But uh, yeah, so so back then uh, the early brass shells um, that were beaded uh, were tack welded uh, just under um, the bead there to join the two uh, top half of the drum and the bottom half essentially. Okay, and uh, that helped keep the the drum in round. It, it definitely made for a much more uh, better. Um, point in the shell to butt the two halves together um and so really that's kind of how it came about but interestingly enough um, that also had uh, played a role into the sonic characteristics and performance of the drum um and really any anytime you do anything to a drum you modify it uh, in any shape way or form it's going to respond in a specific way and it may be good or it may be bad and i feel like a lot of the times um you know, there was an intention that that Ludwig went after in a specific design and they landed on an augmentation to the drum nine times out of 10, which is cool. So there's a lot of happy accidents, I feel like, in a lot of the innovation that went on uh, yeah. at Ludwig over the years. Uh, but mm-hmm. now today through like really understanding the principles of uh, the build and working with the engineers and things like that, we, we really start to understand um, what a lot of these components and elements in the makeup of a specific drum does and how that... Um, plays a, a critical role into the overall performance and sound of the drum. Yeah, that's awesome. But I mean, in 1919, I'm sure it was more, let's kind of figure this out because that was 
very close to the uh, the advent of the drum set. Um, so oh, totally that's amazing. Yeah. So you said it was called the inspiration model at first. Yeah. So it was introduced as the inspiration model, and and that that name for it didn't last too long. Um, it, it was offered, it was cataloged for quite a few uh, number of years as the inspiration model, but the drum that sort of got the wider recognition just because of the overall presentation of the drum uh, was obviously the deluxe model with the engraving mm-hmm. and things like that. So the inspiration model was just all solid uh, black nickel plating um, gotcha. all the way around with brass trimming. And by 1923, the, they sort of played off of that same theme of the Inspiration model and introduced a deluxe drum. And, and they, they threw a few more things at it. You obviously like the engraving. Um, they added uh, different lug configurations to it um, as well. And that sort of caught more of the attention of players because it not only did it capture this really rich uh, sound that brass is known to have, uh, it just had such a really unique and and really jaw dropping presentation to it. Yeah, the um, I don't know the engraving. There's something about it that I think everyone just loves. Which, I mean, it's kind of one, like maybe Ringo's drum set as well. But it's one of those things where it just you you think of Ludwig when you think of a Black Beauty, which I guess we'll get there. But it's kind of ironic because they were you guys were not the first people to coin the term Black Beauty, right? That was Slingerland, I believe. Hey guys, I want to pause here real quick because what I just said about Slingerland being the first uh, to manufacture the Black Beauty was actually incorrect. Um, A friend of mine, Nate Testa of Testa Beat Drums and the official Snare Geek on Instagram, out of the blue sent me a message saying, hey, check this out. Uh, It was an article about the George B. Stone Drum Company in a 1925 article has a stone deluxe drum outfit that features a 4x14 black beauty separate tension snare. So as far as I know, George B. Stone Drum Company was the first to actually coin the term black beauty. Now going off of a catalog from 1928 about Slingerland, they have a snare drum called the Black Beauty Artist Model, which is actually an engraved snare drum. So I think... You know, you can take it for what it's worth. 1928 Slingerland Black Beauty engraved metal drum. 1925 George B. Stone wood snare drum separate tension Black Beauty. And I will post in the show notes the information about these so you can actually see the articles um, of the the George B. Stone catalog from bostondrumbuilders.com and then the um, Slingerland article from coopersvintagedrums.com. Um, I guess we, we've had the, the bigger fan base to that to that specific drum, um, and we had our, our version of doing it as well. And through the years of sort of these these older twenties drums, really uh, having such a such a cult following to them, um, there was a um, yeah, obviously the name thrown around because all these old catalogs didn't exist. Nobody knew what it was really called. Uh, yeah. I guess so. You see a drum, and you and you, you know the first thing that came to mind to some people was it's a black drum and it's beautiful. So <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty. Tr- yeah, you can put that together pretty easily. Yeah, yeah, um, no doubt. Actually, back back in I think when they reissued the drum in the late seventies, there was a. I do remember. I have a copy of this somewhere in the house too. There, there's a, an ad where. Uh, Ludwig sort of writes the story of how that they adopted that nickname, and it was through um, some band director um, calling out, uh, you know, to the the, the percussion uh, a snare percussionist uh, in the ensemble, um, really calling out that drum, and and he would he would be like, hey, you know, play 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 that beautiful drum, that Black Beauty drum. That's what you got to play. Oh, that's cool. Um, so yeah, there's a, there seems to be kind of a story that the Ludwigs. Um, um, had and, and and also um uh talked about um when they reissued this drum and what made it special and how uh the naming just had a, a pretty cool backstory to it as well yeah yeah no so you just said um and we should we'll keep going down the line but you said reissued because like there's different eras of black beauties where they're more like um people always say they want the black beauty and then you look at like a 1928 one but what they really want is like a seventies black beauty or something like that for different, like makeup of the metal, which don't let me get ahead. We can get there. But, um, so yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Take it away from there. 
kind of going back to the early 20s and, and walking along the timeline. So um, by by the late 20s, obviously, Ludwig had hit some hardships um, uh, as as uh, William F. Ludwig, as a, the you know, it being a from it being a family brand, they had to sell it off to uh, um, to Seiji Khan, who at the time owned Lady. Um, so mm-hmm. just before that, you know, a lot a lot of what they had offered in the catalog kind of went away. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I can't really speak to that. I don't know the facts of why they chose to no longer make the the deluxe drum and things like that. But um, it seems like they they definitely manufactured quite a bit of these throughout um, that period of of sort of it, its its first time being offered. Um, and throughout the years, it, it obviously landed in the hands of some pretty well esteemed drummers. And you know, just like anything else, when when you hear a lot of captivating. Uh, performances and compelling pieces of music being played. Um, a lot of the times, you know, if, if you're a musician yourself, or you know, you're you're you're, you're going to ask a question. Hey, what'd you use on that? You know that, that you know your performance sounded so great. Like obviously, the playing had a big part to do in it, but you know, how did yeah. the instrument sort of influence that as well? And so through sort of word of mouth, you know, I think the word got out that you know this drum was a thing, and 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 um, it sort of built its its uh, its clout out in the um, in the marketplace and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, after, after Ludwig had sold, obviously he still remained part of the operation, but I think, um, you know, it sort of cooled down the promotion of this drum, but at the same time, I think there was sort of an underground, uh, brewing of, of, um, clout and reputation and, and hype for this drum, um, you know, for, for the, for the, you know, three or so decades to come. Um, you know, post 1920s. Yeah. Now, did um, did WFL continue to make the Black Beauty under the WFL name? Uh, no, no. Uh, they um, I, obviously brass was was the primary alloy when it came down to metal snare drums. The first, yeah. uh, the first Ludwig all metal shell was was a brass nickel plated shell. So the the earlier Ludwig metal shells. Um, from the from you know 1912 I think is when the first first all metal show came out uh, and onward those were or through the early 20s before the uh, inspirational model came out or the inspiration model came out um, those were all nickel over brass um, shells okay. so the, the alloy w- was always was always brass and when uh, WFL drums started started their operations and they were making uh, brass uh, or metal shells they were still using the brass alloy but I, I don't know why they favored the nickel plating mm. um, over the over the black nickel plating, but it seemed like that was that kind of became a, a standard look for for so many years when they used a, a brass alloy, um, and obviously when they switched over to aluminum, they tried to capture that same luster uh, and tone of that luster by chrome plating it, things like that. So, gotcha. That's interesting, and I'm sure there was like. I don't know my WFL dates that well at this point, but like I'm sure there was some wartime stuff in there as well, where they weren't making metal drums in that you know late 30s, 40s period. Oh yeah, so yeah, something. totally. Yeah, they they really had to sort of retool their factories and 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 uh, redesign things so that they weren't incorporating a lot of metal during uh, the the era of World War II, I, 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 uh, and which was the the WFL era. Um, so that's where you saw like drums with wood lugs and wood hoops. And I think the only metal parts really were, were screws here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even down to like tripod stands and things like that, those were all like wooden based and stuff. So it's pretty cool to that's see cool. the, the evolution of, of drumming, uh, of drums, because obviously, you know, back in the early twenties, the technology and the, and the approach and the understanding of all this stuff was still very primitive. And as it, it was kind of forced to evolve, you know, based they it kind of reacted to, uh, the, you know, the, the things that were just accessible and, 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 uh, available at any given time. And a lot of times that meant that they would have to, um, look at alternatives and alternative designs to sort of, uh, be able to achieve a lot of the same product that they were offering or people, you know, were demanding, um, yeah. at this time. So it, it's always super fascinating to me, I guess I'm, I'm like a really big, like sort of history romantic <laughs> in that oh my, sense. Yeah. Uh, and you are too, obviously. So yeah, uh, for sure. now I understand why, why Wolf connected us, but uh, yeah, it's uh, that, that era, you know, post, post twenties, it was kind of, uh, 
it was it was pretty dark uh, as far as you know. There wasn't really much happening with the Ludwig name and the Black Beauty drum. It, you really kind of have to fast forward uh, to the late seventies. Cool. Well, um, then go ahead and fast forward. So, I mean, I'm sure at that point, still people were like using them. The drums didn't just disappear. So, I'm sure they were, they still you know showed up with. I guess a lot of the users of this time from 1919 up until, you know, through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s would be like jazz guys, big band. It would be that type of uh, application, right? Yeah. And I want to say, you know, I could be wrong on on this assumption, but I want to say that, you know, it definitely, I think it it found itself mostly in the scene of, of, of orchestral players. Um, okay. Uh, through, throughout its existence, and that was a really big scene back then. Like when you think about like what the big music scenes are now, and it's like you know rock bands and stuff like that. You know, um, obviously yeah. ja- jazz ha- had its um, had a thing where you know it was the prominent um, uh, genre and category of music. Um, but obviously, orchestra players, you know, they were they they had a very a very big audience back then. Um, and I think a lot of these drums existed in that particular genre because of the way it performed. It was very responsive. It was very sensitive and articulate, uh, especially at low volumes. You know, one yeah. of the big things with orchestras, it's it's very dynamic driven. Like these compositions rely on the push and pull of dynamics. Um, and that's a drum that's that you're able to do that with time and time and time again. And I think that's really where it started finding... Um, its principal footing, and I think from there, I'm sure it it you know it, uh, other other musicians and drummers you know talking to their counterparts and things like that and their peers and saying you know try this drum for you know a jazz gig or whatever, and I'm sure it landed on a handful of of primary jazz gigs as well. But I think there was there was an un, undoubtedly there was a a knowing and a recognition of the significance of this drum um, yeah. and its performance without a doubt. Yeah. Before we jump ahead to the 70s, mm-hmm. let me let me ask you about um and John Aldridge obviously talked a fair amount about it, but like were they always engraved? Like why don't we talk about the engraving a little bit? Like yeah. how did that come about? Was it a single person doing it like the 1920s version of John Aldridge or <laughs> it like what's the story with that? Yeah, uh, you know, I I don't know too much of the specifics like somebody like like John Wood, you know, I sort of leave that that expertise to him. I mean, he's yeah. done it for so many decades now, but I do know um that it came it, it came to fruition in 1923. Um and uh, at that point, that's about four years into the existence of the inspiration format. So, um, yeah, it transitioned into in, into that particular drum. And really, when when you look at um, a lot of these, the, the there's a lot of intricacies and differences in, in scrolling as well within the mm-hmm. time period of of deluxe drums. You know, you have different scrolling uh, of of the leaf. Um, you know, in different ways that, that certain corners were done and things like that. And I think that sort of represents a different, you know, who, whoever, you know, probably, you know, three or, or whatever, you know, different engravers at any given time, maybe. Uh, yeah. But each one kind of had their own specific stroke and noticing the differences in a lot of the strokes and the pedals and in um, uh, a lot of the other designs, I think, you know, those are, those are obvious indicators that, you know, there could have been multiple hands doing, yeah. doing this at any given time. Um, but that it's really cool though, to, to know that there was, you know, quite a few different people that they were, that, that were that skilled, um, to do, you know, a, a really unique decorative, um, sort of craft like that, which, which uh, is fascinating. And that, and, and that particular thing is what makes all of those drums really special. Cause it, at the end of the day, it really is one of a kind, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, you know, a specific year, a specific person doing it specific, you know, different design and things like that. Um, and I, and I think that's why so many people cherish those drums. It's, it's that it, it sort of, each one has its own identity. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember John, talking about how at this time it was very uh like it had to do a lot with gun engraving which was really popular at the time and it had that kind of swirl and all that stuff which you can definitely see like on you know like an old rifle or something like that it totally makes sense yeah yeah i mean it seems like that was that definitely a a skill that existed uh, amongst you know 
uh, metal workers back then. So I, I don't know that it was it was a very rare thing, but um, I think it was yeah. really cool that they sort of transitioned from doing it in in probably where it existed the most is in guns and to do it on snare drums. People were probably looking at at uh, at drummers kind of weird at that time. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you trying to achieve yeah. here? And then once they saw yeah. the final product, they're probably like, holy smokes, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And so people know we're talking about a previous episode with John Aldridge, uh, who is a amazing drum en- engraver, um, drum tech for REO Speedwagon. And he is the uh, founder of Not So Modern Drummer. And there's a previous episode with him, which you can find that says the history of drum engraving, just so you know. So, um, all right, well, then that's cool. So why don't we fast forward then, like you said, into the 1970s, um, remembering that I guess it just wasn't being produced from that time where Khan bought Ludwig and WFL was out on his own until the seventies. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry if I misspoke on this too. So the early part of the thirties, um, uh, or m- most of the thirties rather, it seems like the, the drum still existed in, in, in at, at that form of being an engraved drum. Um, okay. so it really wasn't until, uh, the forties, which is around the time that, um, that William F. Ludwig left, and I don't know if Got that it. was an influence to this uh, existing uh, during those earlier years of C.G. Khan only Ludwig. But yeah, from from about safe to say from about 1941 um, to about the late 70s, uh, I believe 76 to be exact, would be when uh, production of that particular drum or a version of that drum didn't exist under the Ludwig name. Okay, cool. It's funny how you just said a version of that drum because you read my mind. Thinking, <laughs> do you just like find the recipe book and then like, start making it, or how, how'd that go? Um, it, it was, it was, yeah. So, 1976, when, when they went back to this concept of this black uh, nickel brass shell, um, they basically followed a lot of the the format that they were making current metal shells uh, at this time. Obviously, the, the brand. Um, and mechanisms of these drums, like the the throw off and things like that, have I- evolved in design and, and adapted uh, uh, new technologies and form and function and things like that. So, when you look at the Black Beauty from 1976, they basically took the uh, you know the format of a, of the Superphonic, uh, which they, at that point they had been making for um, a little over ten years now. Uh, so they they ended up utilizing the imperial lug which we saw in a lot of uh metal drums as i think that lug came into play uh in in the early 30s uh right about the time of of the uh the uh 25th uh anniversary and um that that lug uh, i i want to say that it it was a, a william f ludwig design um however when he 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 um started wfl drums he wasn't using the Imperial lug. It was the, the CG Khan owned Ludwig mm. that was using the Imperial lug. But when uh, William F. Ludwig bought the name back, um, he, it seemed it seemed as though he was very um, stuck on bringing that lug design back under the sure. the, the the now reestablished late fifties Ludwig brand, uh, and that's why I think it, it was a design that 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 he he sort of had a hand uh, in in putting together. Um, Because I would imagine if it was something he didn't do and it was, um, you know, he would sort of leave that behind and focus on, you know, a new design or things like that. But I could be wrong. But no less, um, by that time, you know, when he gets gets the the rights to, or essentially buys his name back from C.G. Khan in the late 50s, um, they go through a variety of different metal shell models that they develop. Um, Obviously, the, the Super Brass and the Super Ludwig. Um, those are some of the, the earliest um, uh, post 1930s um, imperial metal shells that that you that you see, and uh, those are both brass shells. One one was a nickel plated brass, and the other one was just a polished brass shell. And then they kept going with that same format with a center bead shell, imperial lugs, and then came the superphonic um, in the early 60s, and I believe it's 1963, 64. <clears throat> when the super came out and so you you know you fast forward obviously the super built 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 a, a massive fan base throughout the 60s mm-hmm. um and and even into the 70s 
so so by the by 1976 they basically had a tried and true format of imperial lugs beaded shell um and by this point you know they started uh messing with the uh, uh the the super sensitive throw off uh was in existence and mm. obviously the p85 uh had a, a number of years behind it as well so those those drums that that they ended up uh producing in 1976 sort of took on the format of uh superphonics um but just with a different shell and the shell mm. that they used basically was a was built under the same principles of those aluminum shells they were seamless um seamless shells uh center b with the same flanged um uh bearing edge and the same shaped uh snare bed now uh, as opposed to the early 20s or or the 20s models and the inspiration model the deluxe model uh those were um two piece shells so now you got a complete seamless shell um and you know just by looking at uh, understanding the 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 um design principles of those drums you to me I, I by default I sort of feel like it was probably uh much uh, time uh time efficient to produce a single um spun shell as opposed to tack welding uh two pieces yeah. together like I just sort of seemed like that that was probably a little more time consuming was that because of the technology of that day that they couldn't do the spinning or was it like just you don't know what you don't know kind of thing yeah i'm I'm not exactly sure i don't i don't know if they if anybody was was spinning shells that early on um mm. i'm sure there there was some metal work taking place that 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 was utilizing some some form of of, uh, of spinning uh, i would imagine symbols obviously uh yeah, well, yeah sure. <laughs> but um Definitely. yeah so it, it just seemed like you know whatever whatever um formula they had at the time and they 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 were at a point where they they had a pretty tried and true formula through uh the superphonic as far as manufacturing goes that they basically adopted a lot of those those components and principles but just changed the alloy and they they went yeah. back to alloy or to the to the brass alloy now is it this is probably just a stupid question but are there are they basically the same drum except the alloy like you're saying i mean um yeah. ki- kind of um what makes them different is the thickness of of the shell um it, i i think influences the the primary okay. difference between the two um and and that's a big that's a big component in a design that contributes to the overall sonic performance of a drum okay so the 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 brass shells um the black beauties compared to the supras uh were slightly thinner um and that uh, that sort of opened up the drum a little bit more and made it more uh, responsive and sensitive and, and sort of emphasized a lot of articulation at low volumes because of that. That sort of helped that out. Whereas opposed to, you know, going a little bit thicker, you sort of tighten up the sound a little bit more, uh, add a lot more focus. Um, yeah. And and it's not as as responsive at that point. So, which is probably great for recording. Which is one of the reasons why the Supra became one of the most recorded snares in history. Which, um, as opposed to having this, you know, snare that probably like the Black Beauty takes more effort to dial it in for a recording. Oh, without a doubt. Um, yeah. All right, that's awesome. So now knowing that they're different in that in that um, in that way is really cool. So at that point in time, what kind of players would be using the black beauty because earlier on it was the symphonic guys um because of the openness and the sensitivity was it similar in the 70s um yeah and and i i think they were they still catered to to that genre because of the super sensitive technology that existed with the super sensitive mm-hmm. throw off um yeah. and so it became a very re- revered uh drum because of it had the sound and the operation and the functioning um, of, of a drum that, that just made a lot of sense for that setting. And then on the other side, you had the more standard lever throw off, uh, which was convenient for a lot of rock guys. You know, they weren't really too, I, I don't think that they were really too specific about like a lot of the minute subtleties, because mm-hmm. like you said, you know, in studios and things like that, control and focus really go a long way. And um, whereas in an orchestral setting, you, you're playing really large rooms and, and you have to um, you really have to carve out presence in really specific places 
um, and to have a drum that that does that like a super sensitive model type um, type of brass shell um, you know that 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 becomes a go-to uh, tool for that application yeah. so it, it was kind of cool that that they did that and they they also had different snare strainer types even in the 20s as well there was a more basic lever throw but they had a you know obviously more advanced, uh, sensitive type uh, throw off mechanisms and things like that. Um, so it was kind of cool that, you know, as rock evolved to be, you know, to sort of accept and want a more simpler instrument, there was also still a demand and a need for a very detailed and, and, and instrument that had a lot of these um, components where you can really fine tune the sound. Um, yeah. Because they're, they're def definitely in tune with something like that. And Obviously, brass has been utilized in instrument manufacturing for many years with 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 horns and things like that. So, the the reason why brass, uh, you know, always existed in, in drums, I think, is is obviously because of its its rich tone. You know, it just had yeah, a sure. sound that was pleasing to the ear and and added a nice contrast to all of the other sonic elements that exist within in an ensemble and an arrangement, um, which is really really cool. So. Um, yeah, I think I think again it kind of evolved um, uh, and it took its form naturally uh, by mm -hmm. by the time it got to the seventies, and it was yeah. it was and it was very appealing uh, to a much larger variety and type of player. And by then, obviously, you had so many genres of music compared to you know the nineteen twenties. Yeah, definitely. Can you explain a little bit about? I know it's this is the black beauty episode, but can you explain a little bit about the super sensitive, like that whole system? Cause I know, um, buddy rich loved it. Um, just take a break and talk about that. Cause it almost has like the dinosonic kind of like big, like extended frame around it. Um, how does it work? Is it similar where you tighten, you know, it's not actually connected and all that stuff. Yeah. So the, the super sensitive system basically, what it's trying to achieve by principle is not bow the, the, the snare wires. It wants to press the wires in a nice, even linear way. Um, whereas opposed to the more traditional like swing side lever throw off that, that, that starts to tend to bow the wires because the tabs fall, you know, they, they, they don't extend beyond the, um, the snare bed or the, the outside of the shell. Whereas the super sensitive wires extended, the tabs extended a little bit further. So um, you, they designed a device that basically pulled that system from both sides upward without bowing it. Um, and by doing that, you, you don't restrict the vibration of the snare wires. Um, and again, uh, going back to the, you know, the orchestra type players, I mean, they, they want as much response and even response of those wires as possible, whereas opposed to where, when you're bowing them and cutting those wires um, a little bit shorter from the outside of the shell, you kind of start to choke and prevent um, that 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 particular effect in a drum to really do it, its job completely. Um, but again, there, there's there's a drummer for that. You know, there's a, there, there's there's a type of player that wants that sound and wants that type of perform and function out of a drum. Um, and there's definitely, there's definitely a setting for it. So, you know, hmm. there's pros and cons to both depending on, on which type of player you are. Um, but luckily, I mean, with the Ludwigs have, have always been so deep into music and players themselves, they sort of understand, they, 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 I, I feel like a lot of what they offered in their catalog was an effort to understand all sides of the spectrum of a player and bring out some of the best yeah. solutions to help a variety, not just one type of drummer, but a variety of different type of players, um, the performance style that they were looking for. Yeah, that's a great way to put it, because it's not about what you may like. It's about, obviously, about your customer. And uh, if I say like, well, I don't really like orchestral music, I'm not going to make something like that. You're just, that's not right. You're missing out on a huge amount of, you know, obviously customers, but obviously too, you're, you're just alienating people. So, um, that's a good way to, to look at business, yeah, which totally. I'm sure you guys still do today. Yeah. yeah I was just going to say that too, it, that those are still the fundamental principles in thought that we, that we follow when we design drums and, uh, look, you know, th this, this era of Ludwig, um, and, and all of the, the key guys to designers and, and, and sales managers and directors and, uh, marketing guys and things like that. Um, all of us are drummers and, and, and yeah. we come in with, with, you know, some of, um, you know, a lot of us obviously have our innate 
taste and, and style and, and, and perspective on things. But a lot of the times we, we sort of have to know that that needs to be curbed for the greater yeah. thought of what we're doing. And I, and I always say this about the brand, like this is Ludwig is the people's brand, you know, and it's always yeah, been sure. that way. Even when, even when the founders, uh, you know, ran, ran the company, um, and, and we don't stray from that. You know, we listen to our customer base. We listen to dealers, artists, uh, educators, and the, that, you know, we develop products for them, you know, because at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not the one buying all of our stuff. I mean, I got, I love buying drums and I got a ton of drums, but you know, my <laughs> tastes aren't going to be the same as somebody else's and my taste might not be as mainstream as some other things. So, you know, we really leave it up to our, our fans to, to really you know, steer the ship. It's not, it's not about us, um, on the inside. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people think that, well, you know, it's, it's the guys with, 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 the, with the ties and, and we don't wear ties. So, <laughs> <laughs> There's no so ties. yeah, so, so let's kill that thought. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but no, it, it, yeah, I, I really love this brand because our, our, our fan base, and I still consider myself a fan of the, of this brand, even though I work for this brand, but I was, I, I was a collector for years before coming here. But a lot of how we operate is is based off of um, our fan base, and we have a lot of loyal fans, and we're very grateful for that because it really um, it, it just makes the whole essence of this operation that much richer, in my opinion. When you got people engaged in what you're doing, and you're taking ideas from people that really appreciate the brand um, and really appreciate what you do, you know, people don't want us to come up with like the next whiz bang technology. Mm -hmm. Um, They do want us to move forward and be contemporary, but they also don't want us to forget about the past. And I think we've done an extraordinary uh, job of that. And I even think that, you know, uh, the chief did an extraordinary job of that when he was head of the the operation uh, throughout the late sixties and seventies. And and the black beauty was proof of that. You know, he brought Mm -hmm. back a drum that didn't exist in the catalog for almost three decades, but he saw the importance of it. He saw the cult following that sort of came to fruition from this drum uh, over the decades of its absence and gave the customer what they wanted. And the cool thing is we're, we're still doing that. Yeah. Obviously, you can still get Black Beauties now, um, which is awesome. So, and I agree with everything you just said. There's there's just, there's, you know, my first real drum set was a Ludwig. It was like a... Uh, nine or 10 piece rocker set, um, which was, you know, I think I paid 700 bucks and I got that. And then, uh, a Zildjian, like an a medium ride, which I still have pair of new beats. Um, which like, I mean, those two symbols alone are like worth, you know, a, a close to that amount of money. So, and I recently rebought another Ludwig rocker set going down memory lane and, uh, it just kind of sat in the corner. So I traded it for the microphone I'm using right now. <laughs> it's <laughs> nice. kind of funny. But um okay, so yeah, I I love Ludwig. But now getting back on the timeline here. So that's the 70s. Um was it business as usual in the 80s? I mean, things got kind of things got a little different in the 80s with all the electronics and all that stuff. Um but did Ludwig stay true? Uh yeah, so so production, obviously there's the, we, you know, we face our fair share of challenges throughout the 80s, you know, at, as you mentioned, as electronic drums sort of came came to rise, and also, um, you know, uh, the import brands or, or the overseas companies sort of gaining um, yeah. really good footholds in, in the marketplace and things like that definitely challenged U.S. manufacturing pretty significantly. Um, but no less, yeah, the, the seventy, the 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 Black Beauty from nineteen seventy six lasted to about nineteen. 19- 81 and they did do iterations of this drum with the engraved styling as well uh, but these were these were mostly machine engraved so the sort of the detail okay. that you saw in those early 20s drums wasn't necessarily captured uh, in the machine engraving um, attempts uh, you know they definitely paid off, played off of the same design theme and elements with the flowers and things like that um, but it just didn't have uh, a lot of that that hand uh, scrolling you know, that you yeah. find in the early 20s drums, but people still love that drum. And, um, you know, obviously around this time, I mean, you, th- you think about the, that, that time period of 1977 through 1981, and, and just think about all the countless, like, just solid records that came out yeah. then, but also how, how much music evolved at that point. You know, you had so Definitely. many more genres by that, compared to like 1965, by the time you get to 1976, 
it's like, holy smokes, you know, jazz has evolved to like a whole new thing. Rock is a whole new thing. And you got this thing called disco and punk rock, you know? So yeah, music, it's a different world. Yeah. Music really took a, t- took quite a crazy turn, but no less, even around that time, you found the black beauty still, still, um, it having a pretty dominant presence in a lot of uh, musical works from back then. You know, you think about, I was talking to Wolf about this. I was like, man, what records do you know that uh, the Black Beauty was on? And he talks about, you know, Omar Keem on uh, the David Bowie Let's Dance record. And he's oh, yeah. like, yeah, it's on quite a few songs on there, if not, you know, the, the, the lead single off that. I know Topper Heaton of The Clash used a super sensitive Black Beauty you know, so you covered like such a wide spectrum of music like that, and not to mention what whatever else was what was going on, and um, that 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 drum definitely found its way into um, a lot of a lot of you know really historic studio sessions. Uh, but I, I think by around this time, even though that production window was was very short lived, uh, for the Black Beauty to like catapult and amplify as you know it, it's it's sort of clout as this next level drum. There was just so much action happening in music then um, that I think this drum got so heavily utilized that it built up, even though, you know, it only existed for, you know, another small number of years um, during that iteration of it. Uh, by then, like, I think that drum took off like a wildfire. And, and yeah. you know, it didn't take too much time after that to reintroduce it again <laughs> so so by i think it was 1983 uh 81 that they stopped making that drum so they reissued it you know that not reissued the exact 20s drum but they they, they yeah. re-brought the concept of that drum back to the market in 1976 lasted to 1981 and then by 81 obviously the brand w- w- had to reconfigure its product portfolio and things like that as it was trying to sell off to um, another corporation, and luckily we got picked up by another musical entity, uh, which was the um, Selmer Corporation at mm-hmm. that point. And that merge happened through the years of 1983 and 84, um, and that's when we moved operations from Chicago to Monroe, North Carolina, which is where we operate out of today. Um, and and also remember that a lot of a lot of the manufacturing um, that went on was mostly done under the Ludwig roof as opposed to OEMing stuff with different vendors um, yeah. at that time. Ludwig was probably one of the biggest drum operations, one of the biggest product portfolios for drum set um, uh, to exist and even percussion, you know, obviously owning Musser and things like that and Ludwig doing timpani. Um, but they, met, they, they did almost everything, a lot of the metalwork, a lot of the casting, uh, for lugs, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's rare. Yeah, I I, I know that they they outsourced a, a little bit of, of metal work to local suppliers. I, uh, coincidentally enough, my uncle owned a factory that did some metal work for Ludwig uh, throughout late seventies and eighties. My cousin used to cool. de- deliver uh, their their uh, their orders uh, to the old plant <laughs> stuff. It was it was that's awesome. Yeah, it was so weird to like come across that. Uh, you know, w- after I started working for Ludwig. I told my uncle about it. He's like, oh, yeah, that used to be our account. I was like, what? I was like, like, dude, why didn't you tell yeah, me? Yeah, exactly. It's like all these years, like you knew I was a drummer. Like, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and and so by that point, you know, they, they kind of have a, I would imagine, you know, when they sold that off, they started to focus on things that were the easiest to manufacture that sold at the highest rate. You know, obviously with, with being a, a big yeah. company like that, that, that's kind of how you prioritize. You prioritize with your big movers um, and you prioritize with the things that you could be most efficient with in manufacturing. Um, and, I, and I think that's that's the direction that they headed in. Um, and that would give them a little bit of time to, to really evolve at that point too because now they kind of go back to the catalog. A few new people come into the picture like Jim Catalano. Uh, he came in around that time who's a, a dear, dear friend of ours, uh, mentor, and he's family without a doubt. But if you guys don't know about J cat, J cat is, is the right hand man to, to, uh, the chief Ludwig the yeah. second. Um, he, he really brought him under his wing. Um, and he was, he was the torchbearer for the Ludwig brand. Um, and the catalyst behind this brand really continuing to exist, uh, up until today, without a doubt. 
Uh, but anyway, JCAT also a drummer. So the great thing was that, you know, even though the company sort of changed ownership, you know, the keys were in the hands of a man who was just as passionate about drums and drumming uh, as its founders. And he's an educator and he, he's really a drummer. He's, he's, he's the drummer that does everything. Timpani oh, player, cool. vibes player, uh, you name it. And he is a pro at all of it. So uh, yeah, he he's teaching at Notre Dame now. He's doing awesome, and he's he's still very connected uh, in in in, uh, in the music community uh, as an educator, and still uh, you know is is Ludwig through and through, <laughs> yeah, without yeah. a doubt. But anyway, so J Cat being a drummer himself, I, I think started to obviously recognize uh, an answer to the people, because again, this is the people's brand, and by 1988. Um, the drum makes a comeback. So it's just a short number of years that, you know, we see production um, of this drum. Uh, but the interesting thing about the era of drums from 1988 to 91, uh, the Black Beauties then were offered um, in, with two different types of alloys. Um, uh, throughout the 80s, Ludwig consistently made metal drums out of bronze and aluminum. Uh, those seem to be some, some of the, the, the best uh, moving metal drums for them through and through so that's kind of what they what they continue to offer throughout most of pretty much all the 80s and that would be like the acrylite and then i'm I'm assuming like the, the superphonic would still be sold at that point right correct yeah acrylites superphonics uh and then you had the bronze phonic that came out in the 80s um uh, cool. there was some standard snare drums that they did uh that were like met. i think those were welded though but and hmm. no less they were still uh, making those out of aluminum and That's uh, awesome. yeah, so the bronze phonic came into existence and, and that had su- such a very big following. Alan White of Yes was like one of the biggest faces for that drum. Um, so a lot of the stuff in the 80s from Yes was, was, was on a bronze drum. He actually still uses that same drum. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah if, it's, if it works, it works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, man, I didn't know it. I didn't know it was like so much like like uh, it, you know, in. 1976 it's back in to 1981 and then 88 to 91 it's like it's kind of like uh, i was just thinking it's like the mick rib or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you better get it when it's yeah. here the shamrock shake it's back <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah it's the that's shamrock awesome. shake of snare drums i love it exactly that's um, great yeah so 1988 yeah it comes back and again for another short period uh to 1991 and those drums you find being a combination of either bronze or brass and they're stamped underneath the uh, butt plate there's a bz if it's a bronze Mm. model and there's a br if it's a brass model um those were offered in you know the different depths and sizes uh, as well as the throw-off combinations and there was a new style of 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 engraving on these now uh they didn't do so much the machine engraving um i think that era of drums was the first that aldrich started doing for Ludwig. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was, there was a few more other guys and also a gun engraver too, that was local in North Carolina, uh, who also did a few. So, uh, even that era of drums, because you had a few different hands doing the, uh, scrolling work, uh, is a little bit different too, because obviously everyone had their own touch and flair, uh, with the tools. So, yeah. um, but yeah, that's a very short, short window um there as well but uh, the bronze uh, of that era the, the bronze version of the black beauty it seems to be like the unicorn like the one that's that's like yeah. the gotta have drum if you can find it <laughs> now what like sonically is different from the bronze to the brass uh, um, the, the bronze is is a little bit more of a brighter alloy but it's just as responsive and sensitive as brass it's just not as dark sounding um Got it. So yeah, it just has something special just because of the, the the brighter presence that it has. Gotcha. And they they were still black, so it was black nickel over bronze. Yeah, they looked identical. Like you really can't tell them okay. apart, and that's why that's why they stamped them. Cool, man. So then, so then, uh, and that was in the early nineties, right? Yeah, eighty eight to ninety one. Yeah, eighty eight to ninety one. Okay, cool. Then how long did that? shamrock shake uh phase <laughs> go before it um came back i love that um <laughs> i i want to say it may be the the 2000s is when when it comes back uh, i'll have to ask jcat actually 
uh, to be a hundred percent certain, uh, cause he's, he'd be the one that, that brought it back both of those times. <laughs> uh, but, but, <laughs> but yeah, it, it looks like it, it was by then. And, and the, the manufacturing of it also evolved. That's the one thing you got to understand about that drum is that it went from being a tack welded shell to being a sponge shell to then being mm-hmm. a deep drawn shell to now a hydroform shell, which is the best version. Um, and I'm trying not to be biased. Like, I'm not saying sure. I work for Ludwig today, but <laughs> but no, I, 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 having experienced you know each one of these in in the past, you know, there's something unique to all of them for sure. But uh, um, for those of you that that don't know, I, I guess I'll explain uh, Please, what, what yeah. a, a sponge shell and a deep drawn and, and a hydroform shell is, but. Essentially, um, a sponge shell is just taking a flat disc of metal and you kind of spin it into shape using some, you know, a kind of lever device uh, that you spin over a, a molded figure uh, of sorts and you sort of spin it into shape. Now, <clears throat> the, some of the, uh, the cons about that um, is that uh, you, you're, you're, you're putting a different amount of friction and heat to that alloy every time and when that drum is completely done and 100 percent cured there's a lot of inconsistencies in the way it's cured from the top of the shell to the bottom of the shell um, and so that has a tendency to affect the integrity of the shell in general as far as roundness goes and as far as um the um uh uh, again, just the, 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 the final shape that it takes. Um, and that could vary from operator to operator to it and in the way that they handle spinning, spinning the drum. So they're like cymbals. Um, those particular drums, uh, tend to sound different one after the other, you know, no, sure. no two are completely alike. And, and that's why, you know, when people find the drum, like it's the drum, you know, yeah, and, exactly. and I know a few cats, you know, studio techs that, you know, have, a black beauty and they're like no this is the black beauty it's not just a black beauty it's the one and yeah like like john said of if you find one that's in perfect <laughs> condition it's probably not the one yeah yeah you know? yeah exactly and and the cool thing uh, you know and, and that statement makes sense because well well yes they were put under different um different tensions then and and no two were, were really 100 percent alike um, yeah. And then the other, you know, then that evolves into being a deep drawn shell and what a deep drawn shell is. And I think we, we did deep drawn from like the late eighties um, throughout the two thousands or no, I think when we started in the two thousands, that's when we did deep drawn and that lasted maybe until like 2011, 2012. Okay. Um, and what deep drawn is, is basically you, you take a flat sheet of, of metal and uh, you form it into, uh, you press it into different cavity depths. So you press it once into one cavity depth, you press, you, then you move that same block of, of material uh, into another cavity depth so that you can further draw it down or punch it downward uh, until you get to your final depth. Um, so obviously for like a five, you probably don't have that, that many processes, but for a six and a half, you would have a, a few more. Um, that's the way it, it, it was explained to me. I, I wasn't around to see that that's the way they did it. Um, but our, our supervisor that that's in charge of metal shell operations in Monroe kind of broke it down to me. And I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. Cause I've always heard it described as spun deep drawn. And I'm like, so the way you're explaining it, there's completely two different processes. It's not the same thing. He's like, yeah, I don't know why they would put those two together because <laughs> the operations are completely different. I was like, huh, interesting. So there could be pe- people that do a combination of both, but the way we've done it, it was either one or the other. So just to picture it, they heat it obviously, and then just like push it into a mold, yeah. right? Yeah. And then and then if it, so maybe like you said, a six and a half, you can't stretch it that far without compromising the you know the metal so then exactly. you stretch it back the other way okay yeah. that's cool and and what hydroforming does is is basically it puts it um it takes the same thing you start with a, a flat slab of brass um and you you put it over a um a cavity um and this one it, it because of the strength of hydroforming you can do it in one shot 
So I, and, and I, I've seen this done. I've witnessed it with my, my own eyes. <laughs> and basically, uh, it's this massive machine with I don't know how many tons of pressure this thing can put out, but it, 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 it definitely can crush your skull with, without even uh, any effort. But anyway. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this thing, um, they call it the skull crusher. <laughs> no, this machine basically... <laughs> takes this 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 blank and and just basically shoves it in one shot into shape and it's like holy smokes did that just happen wow. yeah and and it's funny because when you see the, the the spun process like it makes that look so primitive and it takes forever yeah. so when you hydroform the great benefits from hydroforming are not only in the integrity of the shell but it also improves your product yield and you're you're producing a lot more product a lot quicker which is great mm -hmm. because the demand for this drum hasn't gone away i mean we sell boatloads of these year after year and the great thing about today's drums is uh well our lead times are much more reduced the consistency and the roundness uh of, of these are are far greater than ever before because they do an annealing uh to the material which is basically it's kind of like a, a temperature cure um the way it was explained to me and and it basically ensures that the the the, the the alloy is formed at the, at a regulated consistent temperature from start to finish gotcha yeah and so and yeah. so today you can pull you know you can go to any drum shop that's got you know two six and a half by 14s on the shelf pull one and pull the other and they're going to sound the same which is great too and the reason why that principle is so valuable today when when you're a touring drummer uh you know you 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 best practices is to take a spare right mm -hmm. and you want your spares to not be significantly different um than your main i mean you just want it to be exactly what it normally is supposed to be uh and yeah, the cool really. thing is with today's snare drums because of the consistencies in the in in our manufacturing processes there is no difference between the sound of of your a black beauty and your b black beauty yeah as opposed to before where it's like, whoa, those are completely different. Yeah, drums. yeah. Like I'm sure there was times where like an engineer is like, what the hell did you do? And it's like, it's the same drum. It's like, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> you know? No, it's different. It was not consistent. Yeah. So what is, so it's hydra or hydro form? Uh, like, hydro form. Well, I'm yeah. trying to think like, what is that? So what does hydro mean in that? Do you know like, uh, what that would I, actually? I, I think that has something to do with, with, with the skull crusher machine I'm talking about. <laughs> like <laughs> gotcha. it, it's like, okay. it, it's a hydraulic type of machine. Oh, hydro. Yeah. Duh. Yeah, yeah. Duh. That yeah. makes sense. Um, so, uh, cool. Yeah. Well, that's good to know they're, they're more consistent now and, and, uh, and all that good stuff. So that's, I'm, that's really cool to know those different, you know, that it's evolved over the years and, so like, like I was saying before, where people say they want the really old ones, but maybe the tack weld ones really aren't what you want. You'd want like, if I guess the new ones are really, you know, if you're recording and gigging, that's probably what you want is like a nice consistent one that has the hydro form as opposed to even the, the spun, which could be less consistent as well. Oh yeah. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the thing, you know, going back I, and you know, the, my notions on it are not to to dog you know a vintage drum in any case oh, no, i'm, I'm a vintage guy myself we're all you yeah. know we all have a deep appreciation for this stuff but you know some of the the headaches that i get that i'm sure many people get with vintage gear sometimes is like it tends to to do one thing and one thing really well and when you find the drum it probably does that one thing yeah really well but if sure. you wanted a drum that you could really push to uh endless limits you know, that might not be the drum, but drums yeah. today, it's just like anything else, like cars, you know, you look at, you know, technology and in, in the automotive industry, you know, so on and so forth. It's like everything's involved, everything has evolved to maximize and amplify um, the integrity and the operation of that unit, right? And that's yeah. basically where we are with drum manufacturing. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've evolved from a lot of the primitive understandings and, and approaches uh, and, and, and with great respect to that stuff, because without having done that, we wouldn't have been able to get to where we are today. Yeah. Which, so basically since it came back in the two thousands, it's been available, correct? Like it didn't go away again. It's, it's been available since, uh, it's, it's arrival back in the two thousands, right? Correct. Yeah. So it's been available and we've done 
quite a number of different things. Probably the other thing I should have mentioned about its reintroduction in, in the late 70s is that um, the format was consistent uh, mostly to 10 lugs because that was, uh, or only to 10 lugs, because that was the format for Superphonics um, and things like that. Um, and, and as time went on, that tended to be the, the preferred and consistent format. However, the drums of the 20s were, were mostly 8 lugs. They did make some 10 lug uh, versions, uh, but the majority of them were, were, were 8 lugs. And, and um, um, by the 2000s, you know, we kept that same format you know, throughout the late 70s, 80s as a 10 lug drum up until uh, last year. Uh, last year was Ludwig's 110th anniversary, which also coincided with the 100th anniversary of the Black Beauty, uh, essentially the ins inspirational model, um, to be more specific. And, um, you know, throughout the 2000s, uh, obviously, we offered different versions of the 10 lug Black Beauty. There was a hammered version. Uh, we had a version with, with, with die cast hoops. And, you know, we try to augment the shell a little bit. We do a lot of hammering in-house already for, uh, for timpani. And, um, you know, we, we started, we, you know, we started to do a lot of hammering for drums in, in, in the eighties and so on. And so, uh, when the black beauty came back, you know, the, uh, we offered hammering on super and bronze. And of course we would offer that on black beauty and things like that. So you did have different flavors, uh, of, of the black beauty throughout the two thousands. Uh, not only did it change in, in, in the manufacturing, um, and what that did to the sound, but you also kind of had a different format that you can choose from and what hammering does for Many of you that, that, that may not know, uh, hammering dries out the shell a little bit and adds a little bit more focus. You, kind, you can hmm. kind of think about it as the, the same principle to, you know, in symbol making. When they yeah. overhammer a symbol, it's not as, as uh, you know, it becomes a lot darker and drier, not as sizzly and, um, you know, uh, resonant, things like that. And um, yeah. same, same principle applies to, uh, uh, to hammering. I've also noticed um, hammering to also put an emphasis on the body on the low end uh which is kind of cool especially on five inch drums like five inch hammer supras that, that's like if you haven't tried one of those <laughs> try one of those <laughs> they're pretty gnarly um uh, going back to um the 10 lug black beauty and you know we get to the anniversary of uh the, you know, the 110th anniversary of ludwig and knowing that it was it coincided you know with the anniversary of the inspirational model we sort of wanted to go back to um, that format, uh, or a version of that format, not that format, hundred percent, you know, with the tack, well, the shell, things like that. Um, but we went to an eight lug format on brass, which we haven't done since the twenties. Yeah, um, cool. and then we, we did that, uh, with just a, a standard black nickel brass shell, uh, and gold trim, just like the inspirational model. Um, and, and again, those are probably the rarest of, of the black beauties, um, um, is, is those early inspirational models. I've only seen one in person, uh, and I didn't even know what it was the first time I saw it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. if we, if we got a little bit of time, I could get into that story. Basically the drum is Steve Albini's drum and it lives at electrical audio studio. And, um, you know, I worked with, with Steve on, on repairing a few things for, you know, the shellac gear and Todd Trainer is one of our artists. So that's how we're all connected. And we, I, I reside in Chicago, they're in Chicago, so on and so forth. But anyway, yeah. he, he, one day I was at the studio and he's like, hey, man, the throw off on this drum doesn't work. I don't know what it is. Somebody that was here recording once, like in the 90s, went down the street to this thrift store and bought this drum for like 25 bucks and came back and recorded on it and just said I could have it. <laughs> and, I, and I looked at it and I was like, well, it's a Ludwig. Uh, I just don't know what, because I've only, like the only black nickel plated shells I, I'd ever encountered were a scrolled one or a nickel over brass drum. So I was like, I don't know what, like there's no evidence that this was painted over or the scrolling or whatever. And then finally uh, I got some of the early twenties catalogs and I was like, oh, holy smokes. Like this is, this is one of the early ones. <laughs> And, uh, God. yeah, I ended you paid up, $25. Yeah. 25 bucks, dude. Like, oh my God. yeah, it was, it was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, dang, that's awesome. And, um, yeah, I ended up kind of rigging uh, a throw off that, that works from a contemporary piccolo throw off that we have. But, um, yeah, it was really cool to like hold one of those and play it. But he says that drum gets used a ton. He's like, yeah, people just flip out about this drum. I never mm. knew what it was. And then finally, 
um, I, I found out what it what it was. And I was like, oh, it turns out it's this. And it's pretty cool that you got it. <laughs> God. And you said it was the inspiration model. So it was the early, early, early. Yeah. So it was, wow. you know, something from God. 1919 or, you know, from 1919 to 1926, whenever that stuff was made. Being used at that studio. I've seen videos of his studio and it's just like, it's such a cool place. You're lucky you get to hang out there too. It's, <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. So that's actually a perfect segue because I was going to ask you as we kind of get close to the end here. So has it always been this drum of like legend that is so collectible and everyone wants it? Uh, did or did that start in the last twenty years, or is is that always been the case? I, I I think it always was the case, but only grew to grander scale over yeah. the last thirty years. I'd say. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, again, going back to you know, you know, all those records being cut in in the '80s and things like that, and people like freaking out about like those sounds and those tones and things like that. Um, it it was on a lot of stuff when you think about it. You know, uh, Definitely. it's on. I think it was um, some some of "Ride the Lightning" by Metallica, and, <laughs> nice. and, and Lars was using. I think it was the, the drummer from Def Leppard. It was his Black Beauty that he was using on that. Um, wow. You know, as I mentioned, Topper Heating of the Clash used it. Uh, yeah. Chris Layton used it a lot uh, with uh, Stevie, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Ray Vaughan. Yeah. Um, so you name it, man. It's on like deep blues cuts. It's on punk rock. It's on, you know, Wolf told me he used it on like one of the one of the tracks with Celine Dion that went diamond or something. I was like, holy <laughs> smokes. So like, yeah, it, if there's well, a drum like that can get the job, the job done, it, it's that one. And it has such a fan, l- large fan base because... Um, there's no way that you can't get excited about talking about that drum or playing that drum. And when you, and when you hear like a specific performance or you're at a concert or hear a record and you nerd out over gear, it's like, once you find out it's that drum, you're just fixated on it, you know? And it's got that special something. I've never actually played one, but I have for multiple sessions had my snare supplemented not replaced but supplemented with like a slate trigger that is the black beauty setting or whatever. So, um you know it's kind of a fake version (laughs) but at that the one that was recorded was real and then i just kind of use it to to beef it up but um that's so cool man well um man this has been awesome so why don't you tell people a little bit about you because i don't think we said it at the beginning but you're the marketing and artist relations manager at ludwig drums so you're you're living the dream man (laughs) kind of yeah yeah (laughs) uh well you know i i it's still I don't take it for granted and I I still sometimes pinch myself like is this still reality again I think I mentioned at some point in the podcast you know I I, I grew up a drummer and playing drums since I was 11 and growing up in Chicago uh, everyone has you know a very deep uh, affinity and appreciation towards one of the local brands or manufacturers you know whether it's Slingerland Mm -hmm. um, you know or Ludwig or or I think Camco too was Oakland for a brief period Um, but for me, you know, I, I've always been a, a massive, huge fan of Ludwig just because of the, the, the connection. Uh, you, you, when you're from Chicago, uh, you know, you're, you're super proud to be from Chicago. Uh, yeah. Maybe because of the 90s Bulls. But, uh, but no less, it, it, you know, <laughs> yes, I, I, I came Jordan, from being bro. a massive yeah. fan. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. I became a massive fan of, of the brand and it led to, you know, an obsession really of, 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 of the brand and the history and the people behind it. Uh, once I really start to learn the story of the people behind the brand, that's when my appreciation for this brand grew even deeper. Um, and I just, I you know, I just try to surround myself as much as I can with drums. And I, I took on a lot of different roles, uh, whether it's, you know, teching, uh, building my own drums to the point of starting a, a drum company before Ludwig called Damon Drums, which is named after the old Damon factory. Yeah. Um, and, you know, working at drum shops that, that just specialize in selling Ludwig, like that was my game plan to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've worn many, many hats and all of them, thankfully, involved drums and, 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 and a lot of the times just Ludwig drums, which was, which was the best part of it, you know, to the point where the doors opened and, you know, there was an extended invitation to, to join the team. And, and I, I couldn't have been more honored at the time and even now just to continue to do this. I got hired... Um, a little over five years ago as the artist relations manager. Um, and you, you know, having such a deep appreciation and knowledge of the brand, knowledge of, of drums and drum building and things like that, 
um, you know, I started to take on a lot more responsibilities just out of passion. You know, I was really excited to be involved as much as I could. And I worked with a great team that really embraced having me and, and having my input and valued that. Um, but also the community also really embraced, embraced me uh, just as much as we embraced them. Um, and that really helped, you know, catapult things and move things to where they are today. Um, you know, we get to see really cool things come to fruition and come to market like, you know, an eight lug black beauty <laughs> yeah, and things yeah. like that. And uh, there, there's a lot of cool stuff on the way, you know, we've, we, we, we've kind of, um, it's cool because it, this brand's definitely turning a new chapter and I think it, it's going in, in the right direction. Uh, we have a lot of the, the, you know, the continued support and the loyal fan base. And as I mentioned before, you know, the main ingredient in our recipe is to put the people first, you know, they sort of, they steer the ship. They kind of, um, uh, inspire us on where we need to go, um, throughout this whole thing. And and it's just been really cool. The guys on the inside are great guys on the outside, uh, are, are, are the biggest inspiration, obviously guys and girls. Sorry. I'm just kind of using that term. Oh yeah. No, obviously, but, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's been a wild ride, man. I don't think I would have ever thought I'd I'd possess a key to the to a drum factory, no less the Ludwig drum factory. <laughs> so, <laughs> Literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was insane. <laughs> like I remember when I put it on, I was just like, this this isn't reality. Like, when is this dream yeah. over? Like, what's going on? That's but um, awesome. yeah, it's cool, you know. And things like the Speed King are back, and yes. you know, playing a role in redesigning a box for that. Like that was mind blowing. Like. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, at every point it's just been it's been crazy. Um yeah. but it's all been super exciting and and again one of the the biggest things, you know, one of the funnest parts of, of this job is is the community. Um you know, in, you know, interacting and and building relationships with people like yourself, um players, educators and everything because you know, we all know why we're musicians and the impact that music has and I think we all do everything that we can to to advocate and support uh, for one another, which is really cool. The camaraderie just always blows me away, especially you know now that we're we're sort of uh, undergoing a lot of these very difficult and unfamiliar times. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, see, seeing everybody band together in unique ways and, and continue to support each other is a hundred percent important, uh, but also uh, very heartwarming at the same time and very inspiring. So it's cool to be able to blend a lot, a lot of elements in activity in drum manufacturing that are, are, are responsible for uplifting a lot of people and communities of people. And, and that's, what's really cool. I think at the end of the day. Absolutely. And just to put a date on this episode that we are like in the middle of like being quarantined yeah. with like the coronavirus yeah. and not leaving our houses and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so if you listen to this 10 years from now and, uh, you know, you forget when it was. Just remember, <laughs> we can't leave our homes right now. Um, yeah, and we don't have but, the McRib or the Shamrock Shake right no, now. No, so. and it's a shame. Yeah, we're make, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> man, Yo, this has been. McDonald's yeah. has gotten a mad plug at this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's like gonna like sneak out and get yeah. try and see if they can get some McRibs. Hey, we're not supporting McDonald's. <laughs> no, it's not about them. It's about Ludwig. Yeah. But yeah, man, everything that's been going on in, with the new stuff, the new Speed King, everything is really cool. And I think having a guy like you involved who's younger and just uh, just really in tune with the next generation of drummers, um, it's not like a thing where, I don't know, it's it's not like it's gotten old and stuffy. It's still very new and fresh and cool. So um I think everyone's really happy that you're, you know, you're there and you're working on stuff and keeping the brand fresh. And, uh, and man, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. And, 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 and you did a great job explaining through all the, like the tack weld and the spun and the hydro, like it was very clear. And, and I really appreciate that. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always happy to do it. I know that, um, a lot of this information isn't so easily accessible and there isn't one destination for it. So to be able to sort of sum it all up in one place was, uh, really really cool um really fun obviously anytime i get to i get to talk gear and the gears start spinning you know <laughs> no pun intended um yes. you know I, I it's kind of that's that's you know that that's that's where that's where i want to be you know and so it, it was sure. perfect uh big shout out to steven wool for making the connect <laughs> yeah no he's he's unbelievable and just like uh so wolf like he, he reached out to me after like three episodes when when there was just 
I mean, people had heard it, but I mean, that's like three episodes. This is I'm on episode 40 when I'm recording this right now. So, I mean, he he called me and it was like midnight because you know how he is. He's a vampire. Yeah. And uh, so um, just to talk to him on the phone, I was like, holy crap, this is unbelievable. You're a famous drummer. And uh, it, it really helped me keep going just to be like, all right, people actually like this. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see, to see this take off at, at the level that, that it has. I mean, it's definitely uh, you're the right person for this. I mean, you have such a passion for it uh, and for, for drums in general. And that's what it, you know, that's the kind of, that's the kind of person that, that you need behind something like this. Um, so for thank sure. you Thanks, for, for what you're doing uh, for the community and, and for the, the fan base that you have now, but also for, you know, the people that are going to come, come across this in the next few months and years, this is really critical. Like I said, a, a lot of this information is really critical and, and it doesn't exist um, in, in, in um, you know, a lot of accessible ways. And, and you're, you're doing that, you're making it accessible, uh, which is awesome, you know, and, and you're putting, cool. you know, your spin on it, you know, talking to, to different people and personalities that bring a different color to things and excitement uh, and things like that. So it was, I'm, I'm super stoked to do this. And obviously, you know, being a 111 year old company, there's tons of product and history to talk about. So (laughs) I'm down to do, I mean, we can, we can pick a product, you know, whenever I know Wolf is down to do some and stuff. So yeah, yeah, this this could be cool. We it's, it's so cool. Thank you very much for what you said. And exactly. You're right. Where like, uh, so Vincent leaf before he did the the speed King episode, which we'll have to retouch on because there's a new one, but we could do the acrylite. We could do the superbonic. I mean, the acrylite alone, I think Wolf and I might do that because he's he's taking that, you know, student model drum and playing on platinum selling albums. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, he loves that it, drum. Yeah, yeah. That's another episode. But yeah, yeah man. But yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. And um, where can people find you? Let's let's say that. Where, where can uh, they find you if they want to follow you and all that good yeah. stuff? Um, uh, yeah, definitely. You could find me, I, I, you know, all my antics and goofiness is, uh, is all on Instagram for the most part at, uh, at Damon drums. Um, and obviously definitely follow at Ludwig drums HQ. If you're not, uh, for on sure. Instagram and Facebook, obviously visit our site, uh, Ludwig, uh, Ludwig drums.com, uh, to keep up to date with a lot of our product releases. We do some blogging on there as well uh you know do some artist coverage product coverage things like that talk about some shops um but uh yeah uh, awesome to engage with with people uh when we can uh and super super proud to always have you know the consistent loyal fan base um for, for ludwig and I'm, I'm one of those fans as well awesome cool Uli, thanks so much for being on the show man i really appreciate it yeah without a doubt thank you for having me If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.